The scope of pre-child detention in the United States is vast. Pre-child detainees account for two-thirds of jail inmates and 95% of the growth in the jail population over the last 20 years. On any given day, there are more people in jail awaiting trial than there are currently serving time due to a drug sentence. In fiscal terms, the total annual cost of pre-child jail beds is estimated to be $14 billion, or 17% of total spending on corrections. At the individual level, pre-child detention can result in the loss of employment, housing, or child custody in addition to the loss of freedom. Pre-child detention also affects case outcomes. No fewer than five empirical studies published in the last year show that those who are detained pre-trial will be more likely to plead guilty and receive lengthy sentences. Concerns over the high human and taxpayer costs of pre-child detention have prompted a surge of reform in bail, unlike anything that's been seen in decades. There is legislation related to pretrial issues at the state level in no less than 25 different states, and a number of these proposed reforms involve a significant <coughs> curtailment or even elimination of the use of money bail. Bail reform has supporters on the both the right and the left and come from sources as diverse as legislatures, the judiciary, sheriffs, civil rights litigators, and prosecutors. Currently, money bail is the primary mechanism of determining whether a defendant is detained or released. Nationwide, nine out of 10 felony detainees had bail set and would have been released if they had paid that bail amount. Recent research has shown that even at relatively low amounts of bail, a sizable percentage remain detained pretrial. Many bail reform efforts involve reducing or eliminating money bail. This is motivated by concerns that low-risk individuals are being detained solely due to an inability to pay bail, or that money bail creates race and class disparities in detention. Defenders of money bail counter that by putting cash on the line, defendants are more likely to show up in court. In addition, they argue that bail bondsmen provide an important service by finding and bringing in fugitives. This is a contentious subject, and battles over these questions are being waged in courtrooms and state capitals across the country not to mention online and in the media. Today we have gathered together a very di diverse group of bail experts, not to do battle, but to discuss ideas. The theme of this conference is common ground, and today we hope to identify areas of common ground in the role of money bail. The goal is not to forge a compromise, but rather to have an interesting conversation that may bring clarity to the points of agreement as well as the points of difference. I have a really wonderful group here with me today, and I very much look forward to hearing what they have to say. Uh, before introducing them, there has been a small change in the lineup from what you see in the program. Jeff Clayton was called away on business, and we are very happy to have uh, Nicholas Wachinski in his place. Mr. Wachinski is a lifelong resident of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and has been an active attorney for many years in both New Jersey and Pennsylvania. He is currently the CEO of Lexington National Insurance Corporation, which is a well-known surety company that backs the loans made by bail bondsmen. Prior to joining Lexington National, he was the executive director of the American Bail Coalition, a national trained organization for bail surety companies. Uh, they also provide research and policy on the issues of, related to bail and the front end. Through this experience, Mr. Wachinski served as a policy advisor and criminal justice reform expert across all 50 states on issues related to bail and best pretrial practices. With us today, we also have Spurgeon Kennedy, who is the vice president of the National Association of Pretrial Services Agencies and former director of the Office of Strategic Development of the Pretrial Services Agency for the District of Columbia. For those that don't know, Washington, D.C. is hailed by bail reform advocates as a leader in pretrial reform. For many years, they've operated a pretrial system virtually without the use of uh, monetary bail, with release rates, appearance rates, and pretrial crime rates comparable or better than many jurisdictions. Before joining D.C.'s pretrial services agency, uh, Mr. Kennedy served as programs manager with the NIJ, helping to create and implement field tests, demonstration programs, and other applied research on drug uh, testing and treatment. Uh, we are also very lucky to have uh, Justice Clint Bollock, who was appointed to the Arizona Supreme Court in January of 2016. The Arizona Supreme Court has been active in pursuing bail reform, and I'm excited to hear more about that process. 
Prior to joining the court, Justice Bollock litigated constitutional cases in state and federal courts from coast to coast, including the US Supreme Court. Among other positions, he served as vice president for litigation at the Goldwater Institute and was co-founder and vice president for litigation at the Institute for Justice. Among other honors, he was named one of the 90 greatest DC lawyers in the last 30 years by the Legal Times in 2008 received a Bradley Prize in 2006, and was recognized as one of the nation's three lawyers, lawyers of the year by American Lawyer in 2002. Uh, in between all of this, these activities, Justice Bollock managed to find time to write a dozen books and hundreds of articles. Uh, finally, I'm, I'm very happy to introduce you to Shima Bharadaran Bowman, who is a law professor at the University of Utah and a national expert on bail and pretrial detention. Her work has been featured widely in the press and has been published in a, n a number of top law journals. She is currently working on a book, Bail, the High Cost of Freedom, with Cambridge University Press. Uh, Baradaran has also chaired the ABA Pretrial Justice Task Force, served as co-chair of the Committee on Crime Prevention, Pretrial Release, and Police Practices, and is a member of the Utah Sentencing Commission. Um, Thank you guys so much for joining me today. The format of the panel is each panelist is going to speak for maybe around, around seven minutes. Then we're going to have a, a, a discussion for a little while, uh, moderated by myself, and then I'm going to take questions from the audience. Um, by the way, I am Megan Stevenson. I'm a fellow here at the Quattron Center. I'll be joining uh, the faculty at George Mason Law School um, as an assistant professor in August, and I have done a fair amount of research on, on bail and pre-child issues, and I'm really excited to have such an interesting and diverse group of people here today. So why don't we um, just go in the order that we're seated? Uh, Shima, Clint, Spurgeon, and Nick. Thank you guys so much. Great. It's my pleasure to be here um, and especially be on a panel with Megan Stevenson and also um, Sandra Mason is also in the audience. I've admired their work for the last several years. They've done such great work in bail and um, it's exciting to see that, that they're going to great schools and doing awesome work. So I, it's, um, I actually had a baby two months ago and haven't gone to any conferences, but when Megan invited me to this one, I thought I had to come because they're just um, great, such great uh, fellows here and has done, have done such great work. So I'm excited to be here. All right, so um, I, I'm gonna speak as briefly as I can. Um, I'm writing a book about this so I could talk all day and fill this whole um, symposium with my thoughts on bail, but I'll keep it very brief and really cut it down to the, um, the main points that I have. So um, first off, I wanna talk a little bit about how bail started. So um, a little bit about the history of, of, of what the laws were. So we have to kind of go back to the Magna Carta and the British common law. And what, what bail was like in the British common law was that there was this notion that everyone should have the right to release um, before trial. And that was based on, um, except if you were charged with a capital crime. And so there was this kind of notion in the Magna Carta and what later became the due process clause it said, no freeman shall be taken or imprisoned or be deceased of his freehold or liberties or free custom, nor will, nor will we not pass upon him nor to condemn him by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. What that meant, in short, was that without a jury trial, people should not be detained and they shouldn't be found guilty, that, that the evidence shouldn't be weighed against them until they had the chance for a jury. And juries were really important in those days. And so um, the only time that a person would be detained was if they were charged with a capital crime. And, and the thought there was, look, if you're charged with murder, you're gonna run, you know, you're, you're most likely gonna run. And there was also this, this uh, assumption that if the evidence against you was great, so if the proof was great against you, um, then they would detain you if you were charged with murder. And so really that was the only time where you were detained before trial um, legally. And when the law, uh, you know, when the U.S. colonies were formed, uh, many of the state constitutions, including Pennsylvania and, and others, had provisions that were just like that, which said that the, the right was, uh, you know, the right to bail was respected except for when there was um, 
proof was great against you and you were charged with a capital crime. So those were really the exceptions. The, the presumption of innocence was really respected by the law in those days. And um, although there was a lot of horrible things that happened to criminal defendants early on, I'm not trying to glorify you know, the history of the common law and early colonies. There were really horrible things that happened to defendants. But one thing they did get right, at least on the books, was that, uh, the, that people had this constitutional right to release before trial. The idea was, look, you're arrested, you're presumed innocent, you're only detained after the jury convicts you of your, of your crime, after they find all the facts. And so they were very careful in that. And, and even if, if you think in some of the European countries, they respected this to such a level where they didn't even allow police to arrest you at your work of place, at your uh, place of work, uh, or um, in public, because they thought, you're entitled to the presumption of innocence, you shouldn't be detained, you shouldn't be you know, handcuffed and do this kind of um, embarrassing march that we see our defendants do today, because that, that presumption was so important. So early American law also dictated that the purpose of this pretrial period was not to punish the defendant, it was not to determine their guilt, but to compel them to appear in court. And so that really was the key, let's get them in court, and then let them figure out, um, let the jury figure out what crimes they've committed. So this actually started to change, and for the first time you can kind of see this change in America um, in the 1940s, where we went from this system where there was a presumption of innocence and this idea that um, no judgment of guilt is made on you before your trial, to in 1944, for the first time in the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, Rule 46 provided that courts could consider the nature and circumstances of the offense charged, the weight of the evidence against you, and the financial ability of the defendant to give bail, and the character of the defendant, in order to determine whether they'd be released. So this was significant, in my opinion, because that was the first time under American law where there was this this allowance of the courts to say, well, let's weigh the evidence against this person before they actually get to their trial and before we decide if they can be released. Where, you know, before that, under the, under the Constitution, it was a right for everyone to be released unless you had this capital crime and lots of evidence against you. So this kind of led to the spread of this idea that let's weigh evidence against more than just people charged with cap uh, capital crimes Let's just weigh the evidence against everybody. Um, and kind of, you know, along with this uh, history of the federal bail, um, money bail kind of um, became a significant thing. So in the early common law, there actually was a surety system and people would vouch for others. So for instance, if you're charged with a crime, um, you were, if you were able to be released, your family would put up a donkey or a horse or, or their house or some money. And when you appeared in court, they would get that back. So there was kind of this accountability. And um, what changed and in America became a unique American institution, there's only one other country that allows this kind of money bail, commercial money bail, is that in the late 1800s, there was a, a pair of brothers in San Francisco and they decided that they were friends with some lawyers that would go to their bar. And instead of you know, vouching for friends, they actually started vouching for their lawyer friends. So, in, so their lawyer friends had clients that you know, nobody was able to provide this money for them to get released on bail. And so these brothers would kind of pay the money for these individuals. And then they got this brilliant idea of, oh, we could do this as a company, right? We could, pay money for defendants, let them get released on bail, and we keep the money. Instead of, you know, with the families, they would return it, uh, receive it back. And so this started the, the American commercial, mail, uh, commercial bail industry in America, and it grew quite rapidly and very successfully, um, such that by the 1940s, bail bonds nationwide were high enough that many defendants had no choice but to pay a bondsman or to remain in jail. And judges started setting high bail amounts in order to keep defendants incarcerated before trial. And this resulted in a lot of advocacy and people were outraged and thought, well, this is as fair that people are remaining in, in jail because they can't pay this money to be released. 
And so came the Bail Reform Act in 1966. And the whole purpose of this act was really to stop, um, to reduce the amounts of people that were relying on money bail. Um, but, you know, in, in my opinion, it wasn't necessarily the only result that that, that Bail Reform Act caused, but another thing that happened was it also allowed judges to weigh evidence before trial and consider a whole host of factors in determining whether to release people. So um, again, like the 1940s change, the 1960s Reform Act uh, allowed judges to kind of weigh evidence against defendants before the trial actually occurred. 1984, um, a similar, another kind of period of bail reform, a, a similar event happened, and this, this time the Congress went further. So what happened in 1984 was that uh, the Bail Reform Act not only allowed the weighing of evidence, but they allowed the consideration of danger uh, and whether it would, a person would be safe to release into the community. And so there was also now a presumption of de detention for certain groups of individuals of people. And it was meant to be limited, so it was kind of you know, people that were going to be really dangerous, but it actually ended up being a huge, huge um, group of people and where, such that federally uh, a large majority of defendants now are detained because they fall into one of those categories. So the categories include you know, crimes of violence, those charged with offenses, um, that uh, carry a, a sentence of greater than 10 years, which is a lot of federal crimes, and so on. So it became uh, a real question of whether somebody was safe to release in, in order to um, obtain release. And th that's why a lot of people were detained after this act. So again, both bail reform periods didn't end up really, in my opinion, reforming bail, but actually ended up creating a lot more reasons to detain people before trial, and um, a lot more determinations before trial of their guilt. The impact on states was really great. A lot of states just kind of towed the line as far as that law. The states implemented similar laws in their own, um, in their local jurisdictions. And um, although many states have not create, created these presumptive categories for detention, like in federal law, um, the detention rates have gone up. And currently, as it stands, um, nine states don't have any constitutional light, right to bail anymore. Um, 19 have a broad right to bail, um, but the remaining 22 have uh, a right to bail, but limited by many of these same kind of um, limits that we have in the federal context. So just a quick um, uh, story of kind of what does this mean, what happens because of this attention. Um, the story of Khalif Browder is a, does a really good job of explaining the consequences of not having this constitutional right to bail. So Browder was a 16-year-old African-American teenager, was arrested walking home one day in the Bronx. He was accused of stealing a backpack, charged with robbery, and the bail was set as, at $3,500. His mom couldn't afford that bail, um, and he actually ended up going to Rikers Island, which, as many of you know, is one of the worst, um, 10 worst prisons in America. He was beaten by numerous inmates, stomped on, kicked, uh, hit with weapons by correctional officers. He describes his experience at Rikers as hell on earth. He waited three years for his trial. Two of the three years of his incarceration were in solitary confinement. He never saw his case in court because the charges, as often happens with these types of situations, the, the charges were dropped against him. So, I mean, he stole a backpack, so, you know, allegedly stole a backpack, spent three years in Rikers for it, never was found guilty. And if he had just maintained this kind of right to, um, to release, as the Constitution, I believe, um, uh, maintains, he would never have had this situation. So what are the constitutional rights that that are still at play and are, um, would protect individuals like um, Khalif from this kind of uh, problem. One is, you know, so I'm not really going to talk about the Eighth Amendment, but I'm going to talk about some of the ones that have really gained, gained traction. I believe the Eighth Amendment uh, in prohibiting excessive bail is really significant as well. But let's talk briefly about a few of them. So the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment 
states that no person should be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And um, pre pretrial detention uh, does just that, right? It deprives a person of their liberty. And if it's done without a sufficient basis, meaning a conviction by a jury, it's, it's done improperly. There, um, so release on bail, as, we, as I mentioned briefly, is fundamental to liberty and deeply rooted in, the America, in the America's history. And it's important since, since 1789, federal laws provided that, no, that a person arrested for a non-capital offense should be admitted to bail. And the Supreme Court has made this clear, that release is basic to our system of law. And there's also a violation that w w w to where we talked about earlier that um, evidence should be weighed by juries. And the due process clause uh, does not allow that guilt should be determined before a jury decides that guilt. And that's, that's really what's happening right now, as we talked about starting with the 1940s and 60s and 80s and the current law we have today. The, the law allows judges in usually a one to two minute uh, discussion or even you know, a hearing, it's called a bail hearing, the, the initial hearing, to decide somebody, whether somebody should be released. And they're in that, in that short period weighing the evidence against the person and saying, well, does it look like they committed this crime? And either releasing them or uh, allowing them to uh, remain in jail. And what's significant about that, and maybe early on it wasn't as big of a deal, but since the 1970s, almost every trial, every court, uh, every, sorry, every criminal case is resolved by a plea bargain. And so because these cases are, are resolved by a plea bargain, it's really significant if someone is denied bail. If you're denied bail, that's basically the decision of whether that you're going to stay in jail and have your custod a custodial sentence. And if you're released, even when your, um, your case is plea bargained, you have a lot more leverage with the prosecutor. You're already out. You can retain your job, your house, all of those things, and really have a whole different track. And so in my opinion, that, that early bail determination is basically the trial you get. It's the only trial you get nowadays. Um, most, you know, only less than 5% of criminal cases actually go to a real trial. And so if we're really respecting these due process principles that allow that you shouldn't be punished without a trial, um, it should, we should really allow people to have this determination at trial and allow people to have the release so that they have the chance to actually um, have these constitutional principles respected. So uh, recently, which is very exciting, um, there's been some due process challenges um, nationwide, and there's, uh, there's been some, some progress in this regard. And in, in bail schedules in Missouri and Mississippi have been eliminated for this. So the, the challenges that are happening constitutionally on this issue are that basically um, there are, in some jurisdictions, what are called bail schedules. And this is just where they have a, a list of every crime and they say, okay, this is how much you have to pay to be released if you're charged with larceny. This is how much you have to pay if you're released on, for murder, et cetera. And what's happened is these have been challenged and the, the courts have said that, uh, you know, it's, it's improper to, without an individualized hearing of the individual person, just to look at the crime that they've been allegedly, that, that they've allegedly committed and give them a certain bail amount. That that's improper. And, uh, several courts have, have agreed and have struck down bail schedules um, based on this. Another model, similar one, um, that has been used with the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, that Equal Protection pl Clause has been interpreted to prohibit punishing a person for their poverty. And what has happened with these, uh, similar with bail schedules or money bills set at high amounts, as we talked about, is that um, there's been challenges in several courts where they, the defendants and their attorneys, who are usually equal justice under law, it's a, um, a nonprofit organization, what they've, what they've alleged is that um, it, it per creates this kind of dual system of, of you know, where there's poor defendants and rich defendants, and regardless of what crime they might have commit, committed or even what evidence there is against them, the poor defendants really are being discriminated against just because of their poverty. So basically this idea of punishing a person for their poverty 
is being challenged, and there's been a lot of success in that regard too, that um, that they've uh, uh, you know been able to um, achieve. And like Megan mentioned earlier, um, there's there's a great a great proportion of defendants that simply aren't able to obtain release just because they can't afford the bail set. Um, several studies on this, including uh, Megan's own great work on this issue. So. Um, the, the Sixth Amendment is also an important uh, consideration when we think, talk about pretrial rights. So, um, so two issues there. One is that um, in this important pretrial hearing where somebody is, obtains release or um, is detained, gosh, these slides are going nowhere, um, the, there, there often is no access to counsel. So in at least half of the jurisdictions in the country, the person appearing at this important bail hearing has no counsel with them. There's often just a prosecutor and they're there and that's it. And so they don't have any opportunity and oftentimes they'll incriminate themselves. I mean, there's a lot of things that happen when you don't have counsel as a defendant. You know, they often don't understand the law and so there's a lot of really uh, negative consequences for a defendant. So first is the Sixth Amendment is violated in that sense. And, Recently, uh, 2008, the Supreme Court had, has made a very significant finding that, um, that the constitutional right of counsel should attach at all critical stages, including the early ones. And this, you know, for all the bail advocates, was really exciting because we thought, great, so now we should have um, counsel at this initial bail hearing. But um, because of the Supreme Court's misunderstanding of how the states do bail and because of how it's been interpreted since then, it hasn't been interpreted to require counsel at bail hearings because it, this would be a significant feat, to be honest. It's difficult because these happen in two minutes. There, there's hundreds every day because of the amount of arrests that we have. And, and recently, our arrest rate, so in the, in the 1980s, you know, uh, about half of people that were arrested would go to jail. Now, um, about 95% percent of people that are arrested go to jail. So these types of issues lead to there being a huge backlog and people just having to be processed quickly. And um, because of that, there's not access to counsel. Um, the other issue I believe, I also think that the Sixth Amendment is violated in, is that um, in the early, in the, um, in, the, in the weighing of evidence before trial, um, this is, in my opinion, and this hasn't been caught on um, nationwide yet, but I really believe this is um, accurate if you think about the Constitution. I believe that weighing evidence before trial is also a, a violation of the Sixth Amendment because it violates the judicial role. And the judicial role has always been interpreting the law, and a jury's role has always been fact-finding. And in fact, the Supreme Court has made a really big deal out of this in the last 10 years or so with um, Blakely and Apprendi and saying that, look, judges shouldn't really be finding facts at all. And in fact, in the sentencing area, this has been a really big change and uh, a huge shift because judges were at, at times finding facts and the Supreme Court cut that off. And so uh, if, if you think about the pretrial period as analogous to that, um, judges are finding facts all the time. They're weighing evidence against a defendant, which is a jury's role before trial. And so I believe that's also a violation of the Sixth Amendment. Okay, so three quick principles on how to kind of fix this in, 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 you know, in short, right? How do we have an optimal bail system that's constitutional? Well, I think there's three important principles to think about. One, uh, there should be no detention without a legal basis, right? And the legal basis has to be that due process principles are respected, that a person's not judged guilty, not weight, there's not evidence weighed against them before their trial. The second is there shouldn't be pretrial determination of guilt or bail hearings that are administered without counsel. And third, the a person's release should never be based on their wealth, right? Somebody shouldn't be detained because they don't have $50, $200, $500 um, to obtain release. So, on this first issue, what is a legal basis to um, detain someone? Well, uh, under the due process clause, what would be okay to detain someone for is if the individual 
is going to challenge the judicial proceedings, is going to somehow interfere with the process. So if they present a threat to witnesses or other individuals at the trial. And so there is some basis to be able to detain someone that poses a high risk to, um, to individuals uh, on release. And, and there's a lot of risk assessments. I'm sure um, people have heard about them. This is one that I put up that I, I think is actually a really terrible one. But, um, but what they do are is um, they'll, they try to consider, based on some evidence, whether somebody's likely to commit a crime while they're released. And um, I think some of the key things that research, including my own and others, have found is that there are actually factors you can look at and, and with a high degree of certainty predict who is going to be likely to commit violent crimes on release. And in my opinion, that's what we really should be concerned about, right? Um, if we're you know, limiting somebody's constitutional rights, it should be for a high risk of violent crime. And some of those things that are important to think about are whether their current status with the court. So if someone is arrested, they already have some kind of probation or uh, other sentence we're dealing with, those people are, are more likely to be rearrested. People with three or, or more violent crimes in the past and charged with a violent crime are very likely to commit um, violent crimes on release. Also, old, um, younger defendants. So anyone under the age of 40 is a high risk of being rearrested. Um, people over the age of 40 are very unlikely um, to be rearrested. Okay, uh, so the second point the, is that no pretrial determinations guilt or bail hearing should, should occur without counsel. And this is, um, this is the problem we talked about earlier. It's critical to have this, this representation with counsel. This would help a lot of defendants. In fact, um, it increases their ability to obtain release um, substantially. And then finally, release should not depend on a, def a defendant's wealth, right? Um, it's a difficult thing because what we have currently is that um, uh, individuals are released if they can afford to pay the bail bondsmen. And um, the bail bondsmen are incentivized to have, have clients that will appear at, at court. And they're not necessarily incentivized to have individuals um, uh, to take on, the, uh, I guess, they're not as concerned about whether the individual is uh, uh, going to be re-arrested uh, for a violent crime or for any other crime. And in fact, if a person is re-arrested when they're out on uh, bail, then um, often they're another client. So they have to call their bail bondsman again and get released again. And so um, the bail bonds community is not necessarily concerned about the public safety aspect. And so because of that, um, and also they, you know, it doesn't matter to them um, the kind of you know, fairness of which clients that they are representing. So you know, there's some criticism there because individuals that are more high risk, right, higher risk of committing violent crime are released before trial um, simply because they can afford it. And others who are not you know, a risk are detained because they can't afford it. So because of that disparity, there's, um, there's uh, some unfairness there. And, and, and also this becomes a, a huge racial component too. A lot of the people detained left in um, jails are people that are minorities. And this creates a, a huge racial um, divide and a problem there too. All right, so obviously I have a lot more to say about bail, but I will stop there and we'll go to the others. So thank you so much. Good morning. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. I am originally a New Jersey boy, so I'm almost home. Um, and I commend you for this conference. I am uh, learning a great deal about criminal justice reform from my relatively new vantage point as a justice on the Arizona Supreme Court. And I hope that we have uh, a lot to contribute. My adopted state is a really remarkable place. Uh, it is uh, uh, a state that is not um, unwilling to experiment in often radical uh, change. And perhaps nowhere is this more apparent than in the fact that 
just recently, literally within a matter of days, we went from pink underwear to the elimination of most cash uh, bail. Um, quite, an, quite an interesting change in, in, the, uh, in the Wild West. <clears throat> if ever there was a state ripe for criminal justice reform, it is Arizona. As a result of the recession, which really hit Arizona very hard, our fiscal crisis was so severe uh, that we actually sold most of our state buildings and began renting them back just uh, for, for, uh, to pay our bills. Uh, Governor Ducey's 2016 budget was a model of austerity. We cut almost everything in the state with one major exception, and I suspect that pretty much everyone in this room could guess what it was, which was to increase the budget by $50 million as a down payment for more prison beds. If we could find a way to reduce incarceration without compromising public safety and possibly even reducing recidivism, that would be the ultimate no-brainer. A few years ago, the Chief Justice of uh, the Arizona Supreme Court, Scott Bales, put out a report uh, with a very ambitious five-year agenda called Fair Justice for All. And among other things, uh, that agenda proposed harvesting what we considered to be the two ha lowest hanging fruits on the criminal justice reform tree. Uh, first, uh, eliminating cash bail, um, in most instances, uh, to uh, prevent the incarceration of people who were in jail solely because they could not afford to get out. And secondly, reducing fines, penalties, um, and suspensions of driver licenses. Um, these, the first reform was, and actually the second as well, in part constitutionally driven. Our state constitution, and state constitutions are often left out of, out of the, the mix in, in these discussions, but they're extremely relevant. Um, our Constitution's Declaration of Rights not only forbids prison for debt, uh, but also forbids excessive penalties and fines. Um, in our state, bail reform could be largely accomplished by judicial rulemaking. Um, our judiciary is given the power under a state constitution to establish procedural rules, and under that framework, we adopted rules um, that became effective April 3rd of this year, so our baby is 17 days old, uh, already toddling, very, uh, very impressive. But um, basically, it established, it, it, our rules established that any person who uh, commits an offense that is bailable <coughs> Uh, as a matter of right, must be released on his or her own recognizance unless the release will not assure um, an appearance in court or will create a risk to the community. And then, even if uh, those criteria are not met, that is that the person pre presents a risk to the community or is not assured of uh, appearing in court, um, then uh, the conditions accompanying release must be the least onerous that uh, the trial judge in its discretion um, considers to, to be sufficient to safeguard the public or to assure uh, the appearance. Um, bonds are still permissible. Um, Cash bonds are the least preferred alternative under this system, but they are still available. Um, and when these conditions are assessed, um, the courts must use a risk assessment tool to determine individualized risk. Uh, we did eliminate um, uh, the use of bond schedules, and uh, uh, as a result, uh, we now have a system in which very, very few people presumably uh, will be released on cash bail. Um, this is the first time 
in Arizona that the risk of harm to the community is a consideration for purposes of uh, release. Uh, previously, it had simply been um, the, the goal of assuring that a person would show up at a hearing. Um, and I think that this is a, a positive development, but it is one that, uh, that will have some real world ramifications that I'll mention in a moment. Um, and it is the first time that we are using uh, individualized risk assessments. We are using uh, the Arnold Foundation uh, criteria for, uh, for conducting uh, risk assessments. Our new rules open a whole series of questions. And for those of you who are researchers, I urge you to study Arizona as uh, we go forward here, but two uh, that come up immediately, and I know uh, having had a dinner conversation last night that Nick is going to almost certainly talk about uh, one of these. And that is, are we prepared to accept more pretrial incarcerations? It seems to me that if you eliminate cash bail um, or largely eliminate cash bail, you are going to uh, almost certainly increase the number of pretrial incarcerations. Uh, just to give you an example of, of, uh, of where uh, this may, uh, one of the sources that this may come from, this year uh, we decided a case called Simpson versus Martinez, which I authored for a unanimous court. And Arizona previously, um, in addition to capital crimes being non-bailable offenses, um, our citizens had adopted um, an, a, a ballot measure uh, that made a whole variety of sex crimes non-bailable as well. And uh, one of them was sexual conduct uh, with uh, minors below the age of 15. And uh, so we did have people uh, accused of sex crimes who were sitting in jail for many years before their trials in, in many instances. And we struck down uh, the uh, part of that law that, um, uh, that required pretrial um, detention for uh, people accused of, of sexual crimes with minors below the age of 15 uh, because that crime encompassed consensual conduct. And it was not, in our view, a proxy for dangerousness to the, to the community. And as a result, applying the Salerno decision of the United States Supreme Court, uh, we concluded that it was a violation of due process to uh, automatically lock up people for what in some instances could be um, consensual conduct. Um, the result of that, though, is that a lot of people who are accused of, uh, uh, of sexual conduct with uh, minors below the age of 15 are uh, dangerous people, and uh, presumably. And uh, in many instances, given the option of, of a pretrial release or incarceration, I suspect that our trial judges will use their discretion to say it's simply too much of a risk uh, to let this person go. And so, uh, uh, are we prepared? Uh, Shima gave some, some statistics that were really alarming. Um, if, you, if you have only 5% of, of criminal defendants going to jail, or sorry, going to trial, uh, then this pretrial detention uh, hearing is, is very, very consequential. A second question uh, is, what happens in jurisdictions that do not have adequate pretrial supervision services? And we have a lot of rural um, communities in which um, there are almost no pretrial services. There's one judge in, a, in an area of, of uh, hundreds of, of miles with very, very little staff at all. In those instances, um, uh, bail bondsmen serve a very, very important purpose, and that is they are the only people looking for, for uh, defendants who don't show up uh, for their uh, various court um, hearings. In those communities, it may be that judges will reflexively 
move toward, uh, toward cash bail. Would that then set up a, a two-tier system where if you're a defendant in a rural area, you don't have the same advantages as, uh, in terms of release on own recognizance as those um, uh, in, in a different uh, geographic area? So these are questions that we're going to have to grapple with in, in Arizona. Um, and frankly, we're looking to uh, the people on this panel and others of you and other researchers out there for guidance as, as we go forward. But I do believe that we uh, will largely eliminate the very, very serious problem of people who are in jail um, uh, because they don't have the, the financial wherewithal to not be in jail. Um, and we also have a serious uh, recidivism problem that emanates from that population. Um, before embarking on these reforms, Maricopa County's jail system conducted a study uh, that, uh, that pretty much matched the data that was produced uh, by the Arnold Foundation in terms of the tremendous recidivism increases that occur from people even in very small periods of pretrial detention. And uh, so I'm hoping that at the very least we will um, largely arrest that problem. I mentioned excessive fines and surcharges. For us, this is a legislative issue. And we did bring a number of bills to the legislature this year, including one that would allow um, uh, courts to issue or to require restraints on driver's licenses. Right now, there is an automatic revocation of driver's licenses in a whole variety of criminal contexts. And of course, that has a devastating effect not only on work, but on parenting as well. So we wanted to give uh, judges the, um, the opportunity uh, to require restrictions on driver's licenses rather than the elimination of, of uh, uh, suspension of driver's licenses. And we also wanted to give judges greater discretion over assessing fines and, and fees, which can be, um, uh, which can be enormous and, and financially crippling to, uh, uh, to individuals. Um, you would think, perhaps, that this would not be a very, very heavy lift. Uh, but as in many states, Arizona uh, has a number of groups that are dependent on the fees uh, that, um, uh, that, are, that are produced through this system. In Arizona, not just uh, a, a variety of services are funded through these fees, but even politicians are funded by these fees through our public campaign finance system. Uh, a large part of the funding comes from surcharges on criminal and civil fines. Um, yours truly uh, challenged that a few years ago, uh, but my predecessors on the court um, disagreed with me, so uh, we still have that system in place. Um, these bills sailed through the state senate and then were bottled up in a committee in the House uh, with the committee chairman not explaining at all why he was not going to move these bills forward, but there are powerful uh, status quo forces behind them. So I don't, I am not optimistic that we're going to see that reform uh, this year. This is especially ironic given that our legislature this year unanimously um, approved civil asset reform for, for uh, civil asset forfeiture reform. Um, that is, uh, is pretty substantive, and uh, I, that is um, uh, in the spirit of bipartisanship. So the decisions that we make going forward uh, throughout this country are enormously important for our criminal justice system. They're enormously important even for the taxpayers who are sustaining an ever-growing uh, prison and jail system. and. Uh, uh, they are important for public safety. Um, I am here primarily to report on what we're doing in Arizona, but frankly, I plan to take back a lot more than I impart. And uh, so I am very grateful to be here and look forward to hearing what my other colleagues have to say. Thanks.
completely define my presentation. I'll start my presentation with a joke, since I'm told that's what good presenters do. Um, I have this phobia about being late uh, to, to come to places like this. Why I was here at 7.25 a.m. bright and early in the morning. <laughs> On my way here, I, I ran into a law school student, and we uh, started uh, a nice little uh, conversation back and forth. He told me that he was just finishing his first year of law school. And I said, oh, have you talked about bail yet? And he said, no. Uh, then he gave me a very thoughtful look and said, maybe they're saving that for third year. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is not something that really comes up in, in public discussion very much, but it is really a, a huge topic uh, nationally in criminal justice reform. Many jurisdictions are actively, as you've heard the other panelists mention, looking at ways of improving and enhancing their pretrial release and detention decisions as ways of improving their overall criminal justice systems. Invariably, whenever these discussions come up, the question becomes, what is the role of money, the proper role of money, uh, in pretrial release and detention decision making? And whenever that discussion comes up, invariably, uh, the District of Columbia, my hometown, is usually put out there as a model uh, for, for other jurisdictions to follow. Uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, last year, for example, the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., released 91% of its pretrial defendants on non-financial conditions of supervision. Only 9% of defendants in Washington last year were detained pretrial. Now, that keep that in your heads because when we talk about what is the cost of moving to this kind of system, invariably people will tell you, you're gonna end up incarcerating a lot more people if you adopt preventive detention. No, you end up incarcerating those small group of people who meet a very limited criteria. In my city, that happens to be 9% of the population. Of those who get released, 88% make all scheduled court appearances, every single court appearance. 90% are not rearrested uh, while out in the community, and about 88% remain compliant. In other words, you don't do something that a judge looks at and goes, well, that was stupid, you know, back in jail for you. The system works, and it works without money. We've been a cash-free system for the last uh, 25 years, give or take, since 1997. Uh, we've had growing pains like every other jurisdiction that is about to experience this will have growing pains. But in the end of the day, what we've learned is that in a good, effective, fair bail system, there really isn't a place for money. And we've learned to live without it since 1997. This is important because there are two ways of looking at D.C. Either we are this unique special case and good for us, but nobody else can do what we do, or we are actually a model. And for people like me who have worked in the system and others that are still in the system, I think it is very important to remind people that DC is a model, a model that can be studied, that can be replicated, and that can be followed by other jurisdictions you can implement what we have implemented. You can get the results that we can get. Not only can you do it, but other jurisdictions are doing it. And they're doing it in variously different ways with different techniques, but we are not alone in how we release defendants, the outcomes that we're getting. Uh, what you're looking at and what is usually defined as a DC model is really a model of risk-based release decision-making. You make decisions based on the person's likelihood 
to come back to court and to remain you know, arrest free while pending. What we are finding in risk assessment research being done across the country is that that's the majority of defendants. Most defendants left to their own devices are going to do what you tell them to do. They will make court appearances. They will remain arrest free. It's in their best interest to do that. Uh, usually the problem is our perceptions. Uh, we have created bail systems that are dependent on money and we cannot move away from those systems because we can't convince ourselves that we can't do it without money. Uh, D. Allen Henry, uh, the former director of what used to be the Pretrial Services Resource Center, had a saying that you do something because it's easy and nothing is easier than setting bail off a bond schedule. And sooner or later, the thing that is easy becomes in our perception the thing that is best and the thing that is best becomes the only thing that we can do. We've convinced ourselves in a lot of jurisdictions that the only way that we can set bail is through a money system. We have to show ourselves, and it's through research, it's through looking at model uh, jurisdictions, that there is a better way. There's a better, more fair, more effective way of doing this. I'd like to present at least one of those, those instances and talk a little bit about what's happening nationwide and how we want to advance this risk-based system as a true reform that other jurisdictions can interpret and follow. If I can figure this out, I will do exactly that. Here we go. So what is the DC model? Well, as I said before, it's not so much the fancy bells and whistles that we have, but it's the outcomes. Uh, if you're going to sell something as a, a model, you have to tell people why it's successful. And these are the figures. This is the success that we've had in Washington, D.C., and not just in this particular fiscal year, but consistently over the last five to ten years. Ninety-one percent, as I mentioned before, non-financial release rate. Either you are released in D.C. or you are detained. There's no we'll set some money and we'll cross our fingers and hope uh, going on here. Uh, if you are releasable, if you can be released safely and managed in the community, you get released. And that's about 91% of our population. 88% of those defendants, as, it, as I said before, return to court as required, all scheduled court appearances. And the average is about five, four and a half uh, court appearances per defendant. 89% what we call a, a safety rate, but in Washington it's called a non-arrest rate, which means that 89% of defendants will not be arrested while their case is pending. Less than 1% of defendants are, are re-arrested on violent crime, less than 1%. 88% of defendants who secure non-financial release will remain released in the community uh, as their cases are adjudicated. A local jail is at 60% of its rate of capacity. About 12% of that population are pretrial detainees. Uh, our jail is you know, selling space uh, to you know, federal jurisdictions and others. Uh, that is sort of the state of where we are right now. So when we talk about a model, what you're looking at are these outcomes. You're looking at can you have a fair but effective bail system and as I said, these are consistent numbers uh, over the last decade or so, probably more than the last decade, uh, since we've kept outcome and performance measure data in the district. So what is it about our system that gets us those good results? Well, the first thing is a statutory restriction on money. Uh, you cannot use money in Washington, D.C. that results in the pretrial detention of a defendant. It is prohibited by law. Second is that presumption of non-financial release and preventive detention for the truly risky defendant. This is essential because these three things are interrelated. You cannot have one without the other. You cannot do cash bail reform without, oops, without some sort of preventive detention. Preventive, preventive detention doesn't work if you have cash bail available. Cash bail is easier than preventive detention. So if I'm a judge, prosecutor, defense, I'm going to go to the easiest thing. We're humans. That's what we do. 
The state of Wisconsin has a beautiful preventive detention law, and I can count on one hand how often it's used because people have said it's just too clunky. Uh, either I can do that and have these hearings and all this other stuff, or I can just set a money bail on you. So if you're going to have this system, you have to have both the restrictions on money, preventive detention, and the emphasis on progressive non-financial release from OR all the way up to uh, what we call high-risk supervision. You have to have risk assessment. It was mentioned before, the Arnold tool is, is a successful and popular risk assessment across the country. We in DC uh, developed our own risk assessment. It's a little larger than other uh, risk assessments, but that's because we're DC and that's what we do. Uh, risk management, where you monitor, supervise, provide support for those defendants in the community. Integrating treatment into supervision, which is vital because the two risk factors, at least I believe, that contribute most to failure are substance abuse and mental health issues, the behavioral health arena. We don't do a good job there across the country, and not just in pretrial, but also probation and community supervision. But you have to be able to integrate that sort of service into your supervision to be successful. And you have to have performance measures. You got to collect data. We're lousy at collecting data. You have to take that information and use feedback to improve what you do. And every now and then you got to ask your customers, your judges, defendants, the people who work for you, remember those guys? You got to ask them how satisfied are you with the process? And you have to use all of that information to improve. That is the system that we try to, to show as the DC model. This is the thing that if you implement, you should be able to see the same outcomes that we are. This is very briefly the, the one section of the DC bill, and I'll, I can get this for you if you'd like, uh, where the use of financial conditions of supervision are restricted. Again, we didn't outlaw money. That is a perception that a lot of people have. No, we didn't outlaw it. We didn't need to outlaw it. We simply restricted its use. So if you are a judge and you set a bond on a defendant and that bond results in them still being uh, detained within 24 hours, that defendant is right in front of you again. And you have to reconsider his or her conditions of supervision. If you do that enough to your typical judge, that judge will change his or her behavior. <laughs> Uh, that is what we humans do. If you give us that kind of impetus, we'll, we'll change eventually. As I say to people who are in the middle of reforms right now and they're pulling their hair out because it didn't happen immediately, I, I say, do you think it happened immediately with us? Uh, it took time for this kind of reform. This is adaptive. This is a cultural reform for most courts. And you don't change culture within 24 hours. It takes time, it takes the effort, it takes a few steps backwards and a few steps forward. But you have to start with this kind of legislation that says you cannot use money this way. And since a lot of judges want to use money simply to detain, if you take that away, they have to look for other options. So that is the part of our statute that really revolutionized our particular bail system. I want to show you the breakdown because an another misconception about free trial systems like ours is that it costs a lot because you are putting a lot of supervision conditions on defendants. That if I release you, somehow I have to make sure that you come back to court and stay out of trouble. So I've got to really throw a lot of high-end conditions at you. Not true. So you can see from this grid, in 2015, 25% of defendants in the district released personal recognizance simply on their condition to, re to report back to court. That doesn't cost you anything, folks. Well, it costs you a stamp if you want to notify defendants of upcoming court dates. Another 7% were placed into what we call a monitoring category. These are defendants with a one-time condition, verify your address, verify your place of employment, that sort of thing. 40% or so of defendants are placed on what we call extensive supervision. And these are 
conditions such as drug testing and weekly reporting, uh, those kinds of continuous report backs to the agency. A high-risk supervision program is where you would find electronic surveillance, uh, weekly reporting, uh, drug testing, that sort of thing. So you can see only 7% of defendants meet the qualifications for that high-risk supervision program. Uh, mental health services is at 12%. This is, the, this is the area that is growing the most in our city. Uh, when we began to do screenings that truly separated substance abuse from mental health issues, what we found is that for most defendants, the primary issue wasn't the drug, but it was the mental health issue. So our drug treatment roles really shrank as our mental health services population increased. So I, I see that as a population that's probably going to grow uh, in the coming years. So again, what you're seeing is that most defendants are placed on levels of supervision that don't require a lot of time and resources. And the reason for that is most defendants don't present the kind of risk that would require high-end supervision. These are the results of risk assessments from across the country, um, things that we have found in terms of looking at defendants and validating their risk levels, who are low, who are medium, who are high. Uh, the first one is the, the Virginia Risk Assessment Instrument. As you can see, 22% of those defendants are in that one, 23% are in that two. Uh, in Kentucky, 40% are low. Yamhill County, which is out in, in Oregon, 61% of their defendants are low risk. Uh, in the federal court system, this is the last data, which is a couple of years old, uh, close to 60% of the defendants there are either ones or two. I mean, most defendants are gonna fall within that low to moderate risk level. You're not dealing with populations across the country that really have a high risk that you have to address with higher end conditions of supervision. Oops, I'm going over time. Uh, just wanna go outcomes because as I said, D.C. is not unique. If you look at other jurisdictions, such as Kentucky is one, 72% of defendants in Kentucky secure non-financial release. And Kentucky has an 83% appearance rate, 88% safety rate. Uh, in Mesa County, Colorado, 82% of defendants secure non-financial release, and their rates are comparable to D.C. Uh, the federal district of New Jersey close by, 71% release rate, and fairly high rates uh, of appearance safety and, and compliance. So we're not unique. Other systems that have adopted these uh, procedures are getting the same outcomes that we are. And that's the point that I want to bring home and, and leave with you, that when you talk about DC and the DC model, you're not talking about something that is unique to my city. You're talking about a set of procedures, a set of practices that any jurisdiction in this country can adopt and get the kind of outcomes that we're seeing. We're happy that other jurisdictions are, are going with these reforms. We look forward to working with them. We look forward to talking to you more about what it is we do and, and how we've managed over the last 25 years or so to get where we are right now. As I said, it ain't easy, but uh, the first step is doing it. So. By the way, this publication, and I'll, I'll bring it out because I'm one of the authors, uh, is by the National Institute of Corrections that came out about two months ago. Whoops. Uh, framework for Pretrial Justice is Elements of an Effective Pretrial System and Agency. It outlines what I just discussed, what systems need to have in place uh, to get the kinds of outcomes you're looking for and to have fair and effective pretrial practices. Uh, so look for it, and uh, thank you very much. Good morning. Oh, come on, guys. Good morning. Good morning. That's better.
So I'm going to not start with a joke. I'm going to start with a survey. How many lawyers in the room? Practicing lawyers. Law professors. That's a different caliber. Lawyer and law professor, two totally different calibers. Law students. Elected officials. Reporters. OK, good. No reporters, so I can say what I pretty much want to say up here. So I am the guy on the panel this morning who is going to talk to you about the bondsman, money bail, the role of money bail. But I'm going to take a unique perspective at it because Spurgeon and I have known each other for several years and we could go back and forth all morning long on perspective. We could go back and forth all morning long on what works, what doesn't work, and why it doesn't work. But one thing I wanted to start with today, and it's odd that Shima started with Khalif Browder because I'm going to talk about Khalif as well. But I'm going to hit you with a little Latin. Post hoc ergo propter hoc. Remember that as I go through my talk this morning. So a little bit more about me. I'm not just a guy who's worked for the American Bail Coalition. I'm not just a guy who has now serving in a capacity at a bail surety company. I started my career as a practicing criminal defense attorney about 17 blocks from here at 1601 Market Street. My first assignment was to handle bail arraignment arguments in the basement of the CJC. When I started my career, money bail was the devil, bondsmen didn't exist, and I had no clue what the hell I was talking about. Why? Because I worked in Philadelphia when those two things were not the norm. The norm in Philadelphia was release on own recognizance, 10%, release on special conditions, fill in the blank. But let's talk about Khalif for a second. And let's talk about a lot of the failures of the Khalif Browder story. Failure number one, the media coverage. Khalif was not detained on a $3,500 bail. Khalif was arrested as a juvenile for stealing something. He went through adjudication. He stole a backpack after he was adjudicated. And under New York's arcane law, yes, a $3,500 bail was assessed on a 16-year-old juvenile. Failure. Juvenile court is a court of rehabilitation. Bail, money bail has no role in juvenile court. And anyone who wants to argue with me, we can spend the whole day debating that. These are kids. Help them get fixed. Help them get better and move past the bad decision. Failure number two, violation of probation and parole. What resulted in that young man's life was bail was revoked and he was detained for three years. Failure number two. Failure number three. New York doesn't permit on a VOP in juvenile court for bail reviews. So despite the fact that his public defender asked for bail review not less than 10 times, every single time it was denied, 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 until the prosecutor essentially stood up and said, I can't prove my case anymore, at which point a judge said, we're not keeping this young man in. He's going to be released. Khalif hung himself because he was charged with a third crime. And most people don't know that. Why do I know that? Because I was working in bail-related issues in New York City and New York when Khalif met his untimely, unfortunate, and abysmal demise. That should never have happened. But it's not a money bail issue. It's a process issue. Let's talk about money bail and why money bail is an important matter or important tool to preserve. As we go through the conversation on bail and bail reform, as a criminal defense attorney, I have grave objections to the notion of bail reform, which has been defined as three things in the last two years. Number one, increase preventive detention, or more readily, use preventative detention in a proper fashion. What does that mean in most jurisdictions? In most jurisdictions, it means empowering judges to say, you remain detained from the time of your arrest until the time of your adjudication with no opportunity for liberty. They lack evidentiary and procedural protections. In many states, they lack burdens of proof. And in many states, a review of re that type of preventive detention does not happen absent some manifest change in circumstances, either in the facts and circumstances of the prosecution or the facts and circumstances related to the defendant. Let's talk about what does that mean for a system that has relied on preventive detention for a long period of time. We heard about the history of bail reform. 
1984 Federal Bail Reform Act II. What happened there is after 1966 and Bail Reform I, the release mechanism was the norm. So much to the extent that pretrial crime rose to such a degree that Congress said, stop, enough is enough, we need to do something about this. And they passed Bail Reform II, which was the preventive detention concept. 1984, approximately 25% of defendants are detained at the federal level. The last statistics we have for criminal adjudications only, 2010, about 65% of all pretrial defendants at the federal level are detained. I can't tell you the last time I was in federal court and my client got released pre-trial. It doesn't happen. That's preventive detention. Number two, release low risk, low level, uh, what we call casual offenders. Okay, we agree. We all agree on that. Everybody on this panel agrees on that. Everybody in this room agrees on that. Everybody in the bail industry agrees on that. Low risk, first time, casual offenders, the bonehead kid who gets caught smoking a joint at the Eagles game, the bonehead college student who's had one too many beers and got behind the wheel of a car and drove home. We agree. But the problem that we see as an industry and that I see as a defense attorney is tell me what low risk is. You go to California and define what a misdemeanor versus a felony is, that's one conversation. You come home here to Pennsylvania and talk about the difference between a misdemeanor, a legally low level offense, and a felony, that's a completely different conversation. And if you drive across the bridge to New Jersey, they don't have misdemeanors and felonies. They've got crimes of varying degrees. So define low level, low risk, and then agree <coughs> that no one should be detained on that model. Now let's also talk about where, why money is important. State of Delaware has a risk assessment tool that they've used now for some time, and they published their validation of that risk assessment last summer. And oddly enough, what you would think, and Spurgeon's right, a lot of good validations come back and they, they show we did this assessment and we have this result and this is kind of where the, the, the concentrations are, low risk, moderate risk, high risk. But what Delaware found was two questions had to be answered. Are we assigning risk appropriately? And of the risks we're assigning, are the results what we expect them to be, i.e., are high-risk de uh, defendants failing more often than low-risk? Are low-risk failing less often than moderate-risk? And are moderate-risk in between low-risk and high-risk? And they measured two quantums. Pre-trial public safety failure, re-arrest, re-offense, and failures to appear. And what were the equiv unequivocal answers? No. On both counts, the risk assessment tool is not predicting accurately low risk failure, high risk failure, and moderate risk failure. The group that failed most often was moderate risk. So I started my talk, post hoc ergo propter hoc. Don't forget that. I told you about high risk detain, low risk release. But we just heard from Delaware that's the folks in the middle that are failing most often, whether it's rearrest or failure to appear. It's the folks in the middle that Spurgeon was just talking to you about giving some sort of supervision or some sort of intervention. And what that conversation through bail reform has yielded is the third piece. So low, low, number one, detain. Number two, release low risk. Number three, bail alternative for everybody in the middle. Somebody tell me what a bail alternative is. Anybody, throw a bail alternative out, an alternative to money bail for a moderate risk defendant. Someone's going to be released. We need to do something to manage them. Go ahead. Thank you very much. I couldn't have, I couldn't have paid you for a better answer. Electronic monitoring. I didn't pay him, by the way. <laughs> Electronic monitoring. Let's talk about what that is. It's home detention. It's an ankle monitor. It's a deprivation of liberty. 
If we need to have counsel to protect against unnecessary detention, then please, in a system that is going to rely on criminal sanctions rather than financial loss, which is where bail reform takes the pre-trial phase of criminal adjudications, then please talk to me about the civil uh, deprivation of civil liberties that results when you impose an ankle monitor on. An ankle monitor is no different than a modern day ball and chain. Just two weeks ago, I was, in a, I was in a hearing in Maryland where a young man came in and testified with an ankle monitor on as an alternative to bail. He lost his job. He was not able to attend his son's baseball games. He was not able to walk into his son's school. And what's worse, he wasn't able to hide it. So even if he wanted to do all of those things, he could try. Money bail serves a role. It serves a role of making accountability happen. And why do I say it serves a role of making accountability happen? Because that's what bail is all about, folks. We can sit here and talk about the policy implications of bail, appearance, public safety, uh, reduced recidivism. I agree that those are the policy implications, but that all boils <clears throat> down to one word, and that's accountability. How do we make sure that the person who is accused, whether rightly or wrongly, presumed innocent, of a crime will be accountable to his or her peers through the trial process to either establish innocence or submit to guilt and a finding of guilt. That's accountability. And we can all sit here and say money doesn't work, money doesn't work. Raise your hand if you've ever been a criminal defendant. Thank God there's not just me in here. <laughs> When you go through a criminal adjudication like I did, I was charged with a DUI when I was 22 years old. Let me tell you why I was charged with a DUI. I found out for the first time ever that someone in my family was going to go beyond college, going to go to law school. Not here at Penn. This is like the hallowed ground of hallowed grounds. I went down the street to Scrapper Law School at Widener. But the long story short is I was the first one in my family to go past college. So what did I do? Hard-headed Pollock from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I went out and celebrated and made a poor decision to get behind the wheel of a car and drive home. I had to have that come to Jesus moment with my family. And it wasn't my mother. It wasn't my father. It wasn't siblings or aunts or uncles. It was the minute I had to sit across the kitchen table from my grandmother and tell her what happened, that I realized, oh my God. Now, are there horror stories where people have bail set way too high? Absolutely. Are there horror stories where people have bail set that they're never going to ever be able to post and they sit in jail unnecessarily? Yes. But post hoc ergo proctor hoc means just because something happens sequentially before a result doesn't necessarily mean it caused the result. Why am I telling you that? Because there's people who are sitting on State Road right now, because I used to represent these folks, who have made a conscious choice not to come out of jail with a money bail set. There are people sitting on State Road right now with a money bail set who will never be able to leave that jail. Why? Because they have a detainer from Delaware County or from New Jersey or from Virginia. So just because they're there doesn't mean the data should suggest they can't afford the bail. If they can't afford the bail, what is the solution? Not abandon a system that uses money and family and friends like the money bail system, which is how you get it. We've all seen the TV shows. You get arrested, you make a phone call. Mom, I got arrested, DUI, bail's $5,000. Hang up the phone, mom comes and posts it. TV shows have shown it for years. It's actually what happens. It's actually how a bondsman underwrites a bond. But don't abandon that tool in preference for another de deprivation of civil liberties or in preference for more expansive use of preventive detention. Abandon the use or abandon the practice of not allowing review not allowing process. The products can work. And put them all on equal footing. Electronic monitoring, supervision, text and telephone reminders, bail. Put it all on the table. Put everything on the table. Let the judges have every tool they need to fix whatever that issue may be that the defendant poses. But put process together. Set the bail. Have a bail review. If that bail review is not working, review the bail early and often. I've been a judicial educator for years in many, many states. And what I say to judges every time they come to one of my classes is, bail review doesn't stop after you set the dollar figure. Bail review doesn't stop after you put the ankle monitor on. It stops after a finding of guilt and after sentencing. 
Every time the defendant is in front of you, you should be asking if they're still incarcerated, why are you still incarcerated? If they're not incarcerated and they're going through intense supervision, how is it going? What's happening? Tell me if we need to make some adjustments. And more importantly, lawyers, law professors, legal professionals, teach young lawyers how to argue a bail case. Teach young lawyers, every time you're in front of a judge, if your client's in jail, you should be standing up and screaming at the top of your lungs, we need relief. It's not the products that don't work. Appearance rates are encouraged by bail. Statistics have shown that. Money bail, and I, I, Megan, I reread your work again last night, and I really appreciate in your most recent publication with Sandra where you say, that bail sets are not necessarily racial, it's about the arrests, and it's about other issues that have racial bias. But the fixing of bail in itself is not necessarily racial. Look at the whole system, look at the process, and look at that. And that today, for common ground, as we were standing here today to try and figure out where we should be, improve the process. Don't necessarily abandon all the products. And for that, I thank you for the opportunity to be here, and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Um, before we begin with some questions, I just wanted to give everyone a, a chance on this panel to respond to some of the other things that people have said, if, if you would like. I'll say something really quick. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Go ahead. Um, and in the interest of time, I'll just pick one of the points that Nick made, which is, yeah, you should have everything on the table. Every judge in this... In, in every American court should have the means at his or her disposal to set the most appropriate and effective bail there is. Uh, the only caveat to that is if you want to detain somebody, you can't use money to do it. You have to be honest in the way that you set these conditions, not just uh, fair and effective. At least in my jurisdiction and others where money is no longer on the table, and I, I, I think Arizona will learn this as well, if you take that out as a means of detention, most judges, at least in my jurisdiction, again, are going towards non-financial conditions of release and supervision because, as we mentioned before, the numbers of defendants that present the kinds of risks that can be managed in the community are big enough to make that the most effective and most appropriate release type. So yeah, he, he's absolutely right. You ought to have all tools on the table but that doesn't mean the tools are all equal, and that doesn't mean the tools all have the same result. Go ahead quickly. Um, so there's one thing that Nick said that I think I have to disagree with just based on the data. Um, what he said is that, you know, people to reserve the uh, people deserve the right to release, which I totally agree with, but he said that in some horror uh, examples, horror stories, where high bails are set, people don't get the right to release. But the actual statistics are really quite, um, I mean, the horror stories are the norm. So according to BJS data, five out of six defendants can't afford bail. That's why they're not released. So one out of six are detained. Five out of six just simply can't afford it. So um, if there is some kind of financial bail system we need to make sure that people are able to afford those bail amounts. And these are like $200, $500 bails that people can't afford. So it, it's not that, you know, just the people that are set $10,000 bails that can't afford it. There's a large number. And then the other quick um, point I'll make is we talked about uh, something that Justice um, mentioned is that um, would it mean that stopping cash bail would allow more people to be detained? Does that necessarily have to be the case? And I think Spurgeon made a good case that it doesn't have to be because DC has that. But also just looking at the numbers, I mean, the, the people that are even of the highest risk, right? You look at these risk assessments, um, they pose a 6% chance of being um, arrested for a violent crime on release. I mean, considering that's not that high of a risk, right? Even the highest risk and the lowest risks are less than 1%. So I think the amount of risk we're taking in releasing most individuals pretrial is not that high, right, considering the constitutional rights at stake. Uh, only because I just got hit twice, so I want to hit back <laughs> once. First things first, I'd like to point out, Spurgeon agreed with me on something, so everybody write that down. Um, and, and with due respect to Shima, and, and I, 
after having dinner with you last night with our panel and, and listening to you speak today, I do have a great amount of respect. But here, here is the fundamental concern that I have with what she just said, and that is BJS statistics and other statistics right now are fatally flawed, and let me explain why. You're talking about six people who are detained, one of six who's judicially detained, five of six who are unable to post their bail. But that number doesn't talk about the number of people who were successfully released, whether OR or on money bail or on money bail alternatives. But more importantly, one of the things that I have come to be a student of in the last two years, and I did not believe in it until uh, mid-2015, was the, a fundamental lack of data in this space. So bad is the lack of data, the lack of accessible data, and the lack of what data we should be looking at that John Jay College in New York um, set forward a four-day summit, two days in May, two days in October in 2015, uh, 2016, that, excuse me, 2015, it was published in 16, that actually talked and brought together um, statisticians from across the country, people who have done work in this space, the work that has motivated systemic change, and they all agreed we don't have good data. And the data that we do have is fundamentally flawed because there's not a generally agreed upon vocabulary. So pretrial release in Pennsylvania talks about a time in a criminal adjudication. Pretrial release in Kentucky is a state agency. And we can debate what bail means all day long, but in certain states like Pennsylvania, whether it's money or otherwise, it's bail. In other places, such as Maryland, bail's only money. So you have a divergent vocabulary. You have very bad data. And I, I agree that the trends in the data we have do suggest that from BJS. But again, I just I can't let you folks go forward thinking that the, the data we have is the, is the panacea of the decision making. So I agree that data has, um, data is actually out there. It's out there in almost every jurisdiction. It just is usually not analyzed. It's not collected at a national level. When you do collect the data and analyze it, what you see is that there are, I will give you that it's harder to find exactly what is low risk, what is a low enough risk that you should just be able to walk out there without any conditions. But let's just say a misdemeanor, let's use misdemeanor as a proxy for that. In Harris County, Texas, more than half of misdemeanor defendants are detained pretrial. In Philadelphia, 25% of defendants are detained pretrial. In Philadelphia, among defendants who have a bail set at $500, only 40% of them um, or sorry, 40% of them are detained pretrial, and this is excluding the group of people that have some sort of a holder that would prevent them from leaving. So 40% can come up with the $50 deposit that would make it uh, possible for them to walk out. Yes, there might be some of them that prefer not to, but I think it's safe to assume that most people would prefer not to be in jail if they uh, are given that choice. And while my research does show that conditional on the charge and the criminal history, um, white and non-white defendants in, in Philadelphia have bail set at fairly similar amounts. The rates at which they post bail is very different. For example, among defendants who have bail set at $5,000, 56% um, of white defendants can post this bail compared to only 46% of non-white defendants, meaning that in, in action, money bail is creating through the, the correlations between wealth and, and, uh, and race, money bail is creating racial disparities in detention. So um, I agree, let's, let's, uh, let's get some more data and continue to look at, at what it shows. Now, I'm really sorry we kind of started late and we're, um, we're running a little bit low on time, but I did want to give a chance for um, one or two people in the audience to ask some questions. <coughs> come up to the microphone or shout it out. Come up to the, uh, come up to the microphone because we're recording. and. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Mr. Wachinski for the money he gave me for that uh, electric monitoring thing. Um, so I uh, w uh, was a defense attorney. I'm retired now in Philadelphia. And my experience was uh, that uh, I would represent defendants charged with these um, minor domestic crimes, excuse me, in family court. And almost all the time, these cases would end up with a non-jail sentence. But 
What happened was, bail will be fixed on them in trifling amounts. What we think of trifling amounts, $100, $200. They couldn't make it. I would have four or five or six of these people, and they would sit in jail for four months or six months or eight months before these cases would come back, and finally, they would be released. Now, I don't think that money bail works there. I think it was an outrage. And I would keep uh, asking the judges, well, you can't do this. Look, it's, it's not right. People are getting jail sentences, essentially, for crimes they're not going to get a jail sentence. And it is not right. And this was uh, a pretty broadly followed practice in Philadelphia. Um, so I think that it is not fair to say uh, that I, I, if you have people that can't make $100 bail, they're not in the same position uh, as people that can do so. It's not a fair system. It's just not a fair system. I'm sorry. I, I... The question that I would have, in that was the wheelhouse where I lived. I was sharing with these ladies and gentlemen last night as I lived in that wheelhouse where family law and criminal law bump into one another. And I've got family members very close to me who are criminal uh, victims of crime that we struggle at home to, to you know, kind of reconcile that. But my question to you is, in my experience, and I represented the same cadre of folks you did, I never had them sit for four months because I was able to get a bail review in front of those judges. And maybe we're having different experiences, but again, it's the process. I'm not saying the system's perfect. No system is. Even if you shift to a reform system, you're going to have imperfect results. Especially, at, especially when you get to domestic violence, when you're looking at probably two risk assessments, not just pretrial failure and failure to appear, but you're looking at lethality factors in a domestic violence situation, which is a new trend in Pennsylvania and across the country as well. So I agree it's not a perfect system. I don't know that it's a fairer system or a less fair system. We could debate that all day long, but I think that, again, I stand on my statement before that it is process, and it does come down to judicial education, which is another thing that I was trying to highlight. The judges need to understand what low risk is and why they should depart from that number. Yeah. I think I, I one think thing uh, Nick and I will agree on is that Another judges, one? Another no, one. this is impossible. Twice in, two, no, twice twice in one day. day. Uh, judges set bail for the wrong reasons. Uh, when you set a bond, uh, and bond it equals release, it's either because here's a guy with an appearance risk or a safety risk. Too often a judge will set a, a bond because he doesn't like the charge that you've just been charged with, or he thinks that you're going to do a plea bargain, so this is the only time in jail that you're going to have, so this is my chance to teach you a lesson. There are a lot of reasons to set bail that go beyond uh, appearance and safety and charge is one of them, is one of the big ones. What you're identifying is one of those practices where you're charged with this, so you're going to get that. And that's wrong. No matter whether you're using money or non-financial bail, the focus of this decision ought to be whether or not you come back and whether or not you present an unmanageable risk of safety. If the answer to that is no, the person needs to be released. And I would say also, it just, Sir, it's just very I'm easy. I'm sorry, I've got a countdown in front of me, and oh. we've got five minutes. I'd love to hear okay. from, thank you so much. I really appreciate your question. Hi, thank you all so much for this panel conversation. I really enjoyed it. I've been to several conversations about money bail in Philadelphia and national, nationally. I really respect the, the wider array of perspectives that are brought to the panel, in particular you, Nick, I don't often hear from the bail industry or representatives um, with that perspective. So I appreciate all of the comments that were given. I'm curious to hear the panel's perspective on the movement underfoot with charitable bail funds that we see in New York, Chicago, <laughs> Connecticut, and other places. Um, I've heard many arguments in favor and against it, and I'm, I'm curious to hear for all of you who've who, you know, really studied this issue and think a lot about it, what your perspective is on charitable bail funds nationally and, and here in Philadelphia in particular. You or me? <laughs> I'll start. Um, and this is my personal opinion. I, I am not representing any association or agency, as I said here. Uh, there are good intentions. Uh, but they're bad practice. Uh, the, the point is, you, you don't need money. Uh, you don't try to play the game, change it. You have defendants who ought to be released non-financially. Uh, to 
have systems in place where money is still used doesn't get you to the root issue, which is we should not be using this as our default way of setting bail. So I, I, I sympathize with the folks that are, that are doing that. I know why they're doing that. But you're not solving the problem. You're actually contributing to it. And I respectfully disagree. So there's number one, we just disagreed. We're back to, uh, normal, we're back now. to normal now. So let me, let me, this is not meant as a disparagement on Washington, D.C., it's reality. Washington, D.C., six miles by six miles, they have one courthouse, 21 law enforcement agencies service the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Fugitive recovery warrant enforcement is done by the United States Marshal Service. All of that's true. And when I can respect what Spurgeon's saying is that money, I, I respect his motivations. The judgment as it applies nationally has to be questioned. And why I say that is because in Maryland, I was just involved in a very heated conversation over what is or what is not bail reform. And our industry took the stance that all conditions that are going to be imposed, if conditions are going to be imposed, have to be on equal footing because non-financials have a monetary cost in a bigger geographic system like Maryland, $450 for home detention per month, $238 for ankle monitors every two weeks. Supervision has a $30 a week tag that the defendant picks up. Now I say all that to say simply this. If we have a concern about low risk, indigent individuals being held because they can't afford bail and a charitable bail program is a response to solving that problem, which is that big of a problem compared to an entire system failure, then I think it can work. And matter of fact, so much so does the, the industry believe in that as a potential mechanism response that in the state of Connecticut currently there's legislation pending where the industry would provide those services free of cost if the person is indigent. That's the industry's perspective on it. It is a response, it is a mechanism, it, and it does provide that accountability. And that works if the only alternatives are this bail and high, high super supervision. If you're looking at own recognizance and other lesser forms of monitoring, which most defendants need. If you can be released with absolutely no financial obligation or if you're being released with money, I think most people would choose the, the PR release. And I agree with, again, we're agreeing, I agree with that, especially in most states now that about half of defendants are released on, on unsecured or non-monetary entirely. We're taking all the air out of the room next so <laughs> We're can, trying. Can I, I'd actually just like to build on that question, which is that Personally, my biggest objection to money bail is the amount of relatively low-risk defendants who wind up detained pretrial, and I think that many other people feel this way. And my thought is that the best policy response is to dramatically reduce or eliminate the use of money bail, particularly for these, these lower-risk people. Um, do you have another solution to this problem? The fact that money bail gets set not everybody can make it, and so people wind up being detained pretrial just because they can't come up with a few hundred or a few thousand dollars. I don't think you all could see that. Megan was looking right at me on that one, so I think I'll field this question. The answer is yes. There's, the solution is multiple, most multifaceted. First of all, it starts with education. Judges need to understand what bail is, why bail set, what the result of a good bail set should be, and it's my fundamental belief, both as a uh, criminal defense attorney, as a practitioner, as somebody who works with the bail industry, that bail is the most misunderstood mechanism in the criminal justice system you could possibly fathom. Most judges are not from criminal practice. They don't understand it. And it's taught, folks, if you're going through law school right now or you went through law school, it's taught as a footnote in criminal procedure at some point for maybe an hour. Maybe. We don't understand it. So judicial education has to be the first starting point. Secondarily is judges need to understand that they need to tailor all conditions of bail to that defendant. Money bail may not work for a low level. Like the gentleman and I both represented folks in domestic violence court. I'll tell you right now, no condition's gonna work if that, defend, if that offender really wants to go out and commit another offense. And the challenge in domestic violence cases is it's an increasing layer or an increasing pattern of behavior. It starts with verbal abuse, then it goes to casual physical, which is slapping around. Then it goes to weapons and then it turns into homicide. 
I actually took a case to the Supreme Court on that, and the, the challenge and why I bring it up is, what can you fashion for that defendant that would have worked? Is it money? Probably not. Is it an ankle monitor? Most definitely not. Is it detention for his first or second offense? I don't know the answer to that, but you have to look at the individual circumstances of the defendant. And then thirdly, to the extent that a low risk, low level bail is going to be set, find out why the defendant has not the ability to pay it and then respond to it, whether it's charitable bail because there's gonna be some accountability and supervision or it's the automatic bail review. What we were proposing in Maryland was a third bail review. There's one with counsel from the time of arraignment. Um, so counsel's all the way through. You have a lawyer from step one through step none we proposed a third bail review and a week-by-week -week population review, and those are mechanisms that work. Um, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Allegheny County is regarded, and I think Spurgeon, you'll probably even agree with me on this one, so we might actually hit a whole hand today. Um, they have a high-functioning system there. They use risk assessment, they, do, they study their jail population, they communicate with their judges, uh, both on pretrial and bail, and it's a really good solution, but the one thing that their pretrial services director said at a panel that I was on with her a year ago is, know who's in your jail and why they're there. Because it automatically just doesn't, just don't assume they're there because they can't afford bail. Who's there, why are they there, and respond to the reason for them being there. If it's a $100 bail, that not, that's not necessary. Deal with that issue. Deal Thanks. with that um, issue. We have just about one minute left, and this gentleman's very patient, so thank you. What's your question? Uh, one question. Uh, I'm curious about the confound of uh, non-unified court systems. So my county in Seattle, Washington, has 30 different little muni courts. So we can reform our practice in superior court and felony court, and yet I've got 60% of the people in my jail are there for more than one hold, many of them multiple holds for every little burg and hamlet uh, in the county. So, so how do I move forward on something like that when, when I've got this sort of multi-layered court system that is, that is pretty dense? So Clint, this sounds like what you're dealing with in Arizona. Do you have any thoughts? Actually, uh, ours is much more of a unified system. So I'm looking at you and thinking, yikes, how would we do that there? And I don't know what I, don't know what I would say. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's give Shima a second and then. Sure. No, I think a lot of, um, I mean, this is the problem with trying to fix the system in bail is that um, across the country, um, this is done on a county basis. And so even state reform often doesn't really work because you have to get the buy-in of these judges at different counties. So I think, you know, my kind of unhelpful answer is that it has to be done nationwide. It has to be done county by county. Um, in a lot of states, it's not just a statewide fix uh, because of the various court systems involved. So it's going to be complicated. That's why it hasn't happened successfully, and we've tried in the 60s and the 80s, and we're trying again now. I, I would suggest... We, we've got like 30 seconds. This is the 30-second answer. I'd suggest this. There's 67 counties in this state that were doing bail forfeitures different ways up until two years ago. We passed a uniform statute that they follow it all. And if we, you get a baseline such as a rule or a statute that you can work from, then you can point to that. And I understand what you're saying. As a policy, top-down policy won't work. You need to get something that has some legal authority to it and go from there. Thank you guys so much for your, your excellent <laughs> words and your excellent questions. I believe there'll be time to continue these conversations in the hall and over lunch. Mm -hmm.